William Afton is the co-founder of Fazbear Entertainment as well as the main antagonist of the FNAF series. He's the founder of Afton Robotics and a serial killer who was directly and indirectly responsible for all of the incidents, murders, and tragedies throughout the entire series. His role in the series is pivotal, but that doesn't mean that he's 100% new. He could be a combination of different people and different stories, aspects of which remind us of others. So who reminds us of William? That's what we're exploring today. Let's do it. And at 10, Donald Harvey. Harvey belonged to a group of psychos known as the Angels of Mercy, who claimed to kill for the benefit of their victim. Harvey was convicted of 37 of his more than 57 suspected murders, and he had also confessed to as many as 87. When Harvey was hired at Cincinnati VA Medical Hospital, he managed to collect over 30 pounds of cyanide which he kept in his home. He also kept diaries and detailed notes on each of his victims, including how he killed them. This gives me intense William Afton vibes, okay? Not for some certain reasons, but for the delusion of him thinking that he was doing it for the victim's benefit, but still doing it in horrifying ways. It's the exact same kind of delusion that I could see William having, and a similar delusion to what he seems to have in the games. In the books, I don't think he's like this exactly, but his game version certainly seems the type, especially given his appearance in the Foxy Go 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 minigame where he's smiling. And a 9 Raincoat Killer. Hailing from the Deadly Premonition universe, this video game villain is the launching point for the game's story. The murder of Anna Graham sparked renewed interest in the legend of the Raincoat Killer. After the arrival of FBI agent Francis York Morgan, Harry began to keep a close eye on the case, intervening at seemingly random moments. He uses his aide, Michael Tolletson, to convey messages to York, telling him to take it slow and to keep his mind open to all possibilities. As York tried to solve the case, the new killer showed up many times. As more evidence surfaced, it became clear that George Woodman was the new Rainco killer. He had sacrificed the woman of Greenvale in order to become a mortal. Unfortunately for him, York was able to defeat him, ending the terror of the Rainco killer. Much like how, in the novels at least, William is searching for immortality thanks to the discovery of Remnant, and then is defeated by the Springtrap suit and Henry's multiple fires. Okay, well he would have been defeated if he wasn't possessed by his son, but I mean, like, there's still a parallel there. Right? And it ate the Ice Cream Man. Suggested to me by Amanda, the Ice Cream Man comic series is a horror anthology of loosely connected stories that all share the common link of a mysterious Ice Cream Man named Rick, who's also revealed to be Ricardus. Who, while a seemingly ordinary Ice Cream Man, possesses inexplicable powers which he uses upon unsuspecting people. Rick's nemesis Caleb, a man dressed in an all-black cowboy outfit, will sporadically appear in the series trying to thwart Rick's plans, sometimes successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully. Honestly, this kind of story is very reminiscent of William Afton and Henry's story, uh, Afton being the Ice Cream Man, which is ironic <laughs> given what happened to Elizabeth, and Henry is Caleb trying to thwart William's plans, sometimes successful and sometimes not. But no matter what, William always comes back, just like the Ice Cream Man. And Ice Cream Man is very close to how I feel William acts with his victims. Like, he's all like warm and fuzzy and then he just shoves you in the back of his freezing cold van and drives off. In at 7, Norman Osborn. Another suggestion from Amanda that I'm surprised I didn't think of first. Um, Norman Osborn being the Green Goblin, but also the CEO of a very successful company, it seems like these two share a lot of the same ideas, or I guess rather the same concepts. Business owner who by night is evil and wreaks havoc without anyone really knowing it. But despite their secrecy, eventually people catch on and find out their secrets. Superpowers in the form of a goblin serum or being possessed by your dead son. So the two characters at the fundamental level are actually very much alike. The specifics aren't, which is really what threw me off, but it's a part of why we wanted Willem Dafoe to play Afton in the FNAF movie, right? Because he played this kind of character before with Norman. Plus, Norman and Afton kind of sound the same, just a little bit though. Osborne and William don't, but William and Willem do, so who knows at this point? And at six, Thomas Lee Dillon. Thomas Lee Dillon was a serial sniper found guilty of killing five people. Directed by the voices in his head, Dillon killed people randomly. According to attending psychiatrists, Dillon's delusions of grandeur spilled over into the reality of his life and the lives of his victims. His victims were killed by a high-powered rifle while they participated in outdoor activities, sometimes hundreds of miles from Dillon's home. Authorities did not link them to Dillon until he had sent a letter to the local paper. After the FBI put together a criminal profile of the killer, a friend of Dillon's brought him to the attention of the authorities, which in my mind at least is nearly identical to the story of William Afton. The amount of the first victims, the authorities only investigating the murders after they got tipped off by a friend of the killer, in Afton's case that being Henry, and eventually you'll see that there are quite a few similarities to multiple real people, and it's scary. 
At least when people compare me to Afton, it's because I wear purple. Halfway through into number five, Elliot Ludwig. Elliot Ludwig is a recurring character in Poppy Playtime. He is most known for his position as both the founder and overseer of Playtime Co. Elliot Ludwig is an old man with light skin, blackish hair, and an unknown eye color, probably brown, given that it's, I think it's the most common eye color. He is seen wearing a suit during the first VHS tape in the beginning of chapter one, A Tight Squeeze, which seems to be an old Playtime Co. commercial for Poppy herself and for the factory tours that were once held there, where in this video he is engulfed in purple light, which is certainly an interesting moment, one that I even pointed out in our Poppy Playtime playthrough video. Not to mention the whole he puts people in toys thing, like how William put people in animatronics, plus Elliot probably put his daughter into Poppy, much like how Afton's daughter Elizabeth ended up becoming Circus Baby, and then Elliot sealed his daughter away, and Afton put Baby in Circus Baby's entertainment and rental, which we visit in sister locations. So yeah, like this. And at four, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy was an American serial killer who killed at least 33 young men and boys. Gacy regularly performed at children's hospital and charitable events as Pogo the Clown or Patches the Clown, personas that he had devised. He became known as the Killer Clown due to his public service as a clown prior to the discovery of his crimes. Gacy committed all of his murders inside of his ranch house. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home and then dupe them into donning handcuffs with the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. And while this is absolutely disgusting and makes me sick to my stomach, there are still a few similarities to Afton. Killing in a place that's related to you, for instance, Gacy, it was his home, and for Afton, it's his business. The target demographic was also the same with young people, although Afton is a bit more diverse and killed girls as well. And while you may think that this is a stretch, even FNAF made the connection with FNAF AR through the clown spring trap skin. I mean, come on. Dude, that, if that's not a giveaway, I don't know what is. Getting close to the end in number three, Joey Drew Studios. Joey Drew Studios from the Bendy and the Ink Machine series, also known as The Workshop and The Old Workshop, is an American corporation and animation studio established in 1929. This is where he and his friend Henry Stein, along with all the other workers, collaborated for 30 years before the studio's downfall, producing a series of Bendy cartoons. In 1946, Joey Drew Studios was under investigation after reports of hazardous work environments, missing employees, harassment, and excessive back pay, as well as the company's danger of being bankrupt. All of which are the result of Joey's mismanagement of the studio. Anonymous employees threatened to make labor unions over the poor conditions, which included unpermitted buildings, hazardous electrical wiring, and a plumbing system prone to bursting. Which sounds exactly like the working conditions that would be in some form of Fazbear establishment. Plus, there's a machine that takes human souls and turns them into ink monsters. Like how the animatronics get infused with the souls of the missing children. I feel like that connection was kind of expected on the list. But ultimately, in at number two, Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter is a fictional character created by novelist Thomas Harris. Lecter is a serial killer who eats his victims. Before his capture, he was actually a respected forensic psychiatrist. And after his incarceration, he is consulted by FBI agents Will Graham and Clarice Starling to help them find other serial killers. His most iconic appearance being in Silence of the Lambs and the often misquoted line of Hello Clarice have the lambs stop screaming. And while you may not be able to find any similarities between Afton and Lecter, this one is actually confirmed as inspiration at least for his voice. According to his voice actor PJ Haywood, in Sister Location, Afton's voice is inspired by Hannibal Lecter, in a way that he's unnervingly calm even when he's about to kill someone, which is supported by some of his novel counterparts quotes. So yes, while it's not directly inspiring Afton, it inspired his voice. And finally, in at number one, Robert Burdella. Robert Burdella is to me the seemingly perfect inspiration for William Afton. Not only did this man own a business called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, where he reportedly sold human and skulls, he also seemingly started killing in 1984. The MO is certainly not the exact same, Burdella would drug and kidnap men that he met at bars or on the streets, but the same idea of killing people you meet in a restaurant is carried over to William Afton. There is no confirmed inspiration for William, but there are certainly a decent amount of similarities between these two. In fact, if you combine the four real serial killers I put on this list, Harvey, Dylan, Gacy, and Burdella, you would end up getting basically a real William Afton. I didn't go into much detail with these because, well, YouTube might get mad at that, especially when I'm comparing them to a fictional serial killer from a video game series, but who knows? Either way, I think it's a pretty solid combo of four killers, and that's kind of freaky. That's all the time we have for today, friends. Thank you all so much for watching. I have been in Shower Rank on Monroe, and I'll see you in another video. 